Indeed, I'm, I have the luxury of talking about some issues that we would associate with a, a post-material society, in particular Canadian context. So my scope isn't as, as brave as that of President Summerlin. I am barely a child of the 1960s, having been born in March of 1969, and yet I seem to have adopted that generation's naive, or perhaps better put, hopeful belief in the possibilities of collective action for some pretty important ends, and in particular, that generation's interest in environmental stewardship and protection. Analysts have sought to make sense of that movement, why it emerged, and some have pointed to the remarkable first image of the Earth as seen from space that was captured by the Apollo 8 in 1968 as, as, um, as, as a, a way of understanding our world as finite, as perhaps even fragile, as seen against the larger universe. Of course, earlier in, in that decade, we had the alarmist, but proven correct words of Rachel Carson, who warned us that we were making use of chemicals that were problematic for our own health. Uh, others ramped up those concerns and expressed them in broader terms with respect to our fundamental use of resources in our population, suggesting that, that our very survival was at stake. If those weren't enough incentive for uh, a collective response to problems of the environment, we had various images that just didn't make sense. This is a remarkable image. It's the Cayuga River in Cleveland, which caught on fire because of uh, oil residues on its surface. That is the kind of thing that surely draws a reaction. Uh, and we saw popular collective action in response to some of these concerns. Uh, here, one of the earliest protests of environmental nature in response to a oil spill off the coast of California that gave birth to what we now know as Earth Day. And Earth Day was a remarkable idea that, that we must, on an annual basis, pay attention to these concerns, and in particular, call for action. This particular image, which pleads for help, what I find most remarkable is that when we pleaded for help, or on the Earth's behalf, pleaded for help, we very quickly, and without much contemplation, turn to governments, what for the rest of this talk I'll refer to as the state, as the appropriate vehicle to hear that message and to respond to that message. And I have, uh, over the last 20 years, reflected on this, uh, this decision a great deal. I am, as members of the 1960s, uh, have this naive belief or expectation in the state as this perfect representation of our collective good, our collective interest, our possibilities. And as Grace would know from environmental governance, the fourth year course I teach, I have become a little bit disillusioned in this regard. Um, and I'm even concerned that I might have been deluded in the first place. But this is a question, it's not an answer, and it's a question that your generation gets to answer over the next 20 years. And I'd like to reflect on where we're going with respect to environmental governance, what are its possibilities. Now, the story begins with a happy start. Uh, that is when we did look for the state to respond to our concerns, to, to uh, meet our growing expectations around the environment, in tandem with concerns around civil rights and other important issues, the state responded in a most remarkable way. Some have suggested they were suffering from a crisis of legitimacy and had no other choice. Nevertheless, we have a remarkable suite here in Canada and of course in other locations of agencies whose sole responsibility is to address growing environmental concerns, be it with respect to environmental health or more intrinsic interests of the natural world. And this is no small achievement. It really is to think about, for example, the birth of environmental assessment, which is a process that determines in advance of some major undertaking what the likely impacts will be and seeks to either mitigate those impacts or outright reject the project in the first place. This is powerful legislation. At the same time, there uh, are many who suggest that these institutions haven't been delivering the goods. And so I've thought again as to why we thought the state was capable of responding to our environmental interests, our environmental concerns. And there are many reasons, but one important one, I think, comes out of the remarkable response of the state to an earlier concern. And that is the concern of uh, the Great Depression. So this is a theme that uh, has already been picked up on today. Uh, the interests of economy uh, were so profound in the 1929 to 1933 period 
that they had this clear manifestation in all parts of society, including the environment. Remarkably, in the, in the American and, and Canadian uh, prairies, uh, that economic depression coincided with a, with a downturn in, in uh, moisture provision, a, a, a regional drought. And so we had this terrible combination of, of uh, drought and depression, which resulted in circumstances where farmers simply weren't able to steward their farms to maintain uh, cover on, on, the, on the soil, and hence we had the death toll. The state responded to this dilemma in the most profound way. That was the birth of an activist state. Commentators suggest that there was a transition from the state as a mere night watchman, providing uh, services such as the courts and police, and transition towards what we call a nanny state. That is, caring for citizens, ensuring a decent standard of living, unemployment insurance, pension plans, etc. This is most clearly manifest in the growth of taxation. Here is a slide that depicts the growth of tax measured in proportion to the gross domestic product in Canada, Sweden, and Spain over the last century. And from the period of 1929 through to as late as 1950, you can see a very steep curve there. This uh, reflects the growth of the state as an institution that intervened in our lives and in particular in the economy to ensure some stability. This was a grand achievement and especially when you think about something like progressive income tax. I'm not sure whether legislative assemblies today could ever get those kind of radical changes through and especially our neighbors to the south. I don't imagine that kind of legislation could ever be enacted today. So that was a grand achievement. And in that sense, it's understandable that in the 1960s, society in the West turned to the state once again, saying, look, please deliver on this, on this real need. The fundamental challenge, though, is that the request that was made of the state in light of the Great Depression turned out to have an economic rationale. John Maynard Keynes pointed out famously that during a recession or worse, a depression, we must pay men and women to dig ditches and fill them back up. It doesn't matter what they do as long as they have money in their pockets. They spend that money and others can benefit from that through the multiplier effect. That is, when we think about the state's growing role in society, it wasn't merely a function of welfare or social justice interests. It served an economic purpose, the maintenance of aggregate demand. When one becomes unemployed, we don't want them to stop spending or else aggregate demand declines. Aggregate supply is maintained and we have recession. So that call on the state was, was uh, answered in large measure because it made economic sense. My fear is that the call upon the state in the 1960s and 1970s did not make as much economic sense. And so we have a problem well expressed by Bob Ray, not when he was our premier, but upon reflecting that there is an inherent tension between the interests of economy and environment. In trying economic times, the business community becomes resistance, resistant to the development or tightening of environmental legislation. We understand this to be true, and there's no clear expression of that in Canada's failure to implement Kyoto. We are 32% above that 6% below 1990 baseline, and we are uh, evidently not able to, to meet that target. This failure of the state to uh, address some of our environmental expectations has given rise to uh, the growth of a number of other players. What we turn the term the turn from government to governance. And in, in the area of environmental governance, we have examples in our own backyard, an interesting initiative that was enabled largely or primarily by student willingness to contribute, whereby there have been energy retrofits of buildings on campus here to be able to both save money and to uh, save greenhouse gas emissions. In some circumstances, we can have the interests of economy and environment overlap. In others, it's not as viable. The state has become certainly more enlightened and thoughtful in trying to address concerns without merely trying to regulate or limit economic growth. Energy Star is an initiative of the US Environmental Protection Agency, which is now 15 years old, which offers consumers some insights as to how appliances perform. It's, it's well understood. One of my fourth year students introduced me to a remarkable program in Japan called Top Runner, in which the, uh, the firm that is able to get the best rating or the, the best, let's say, fuel economy in a, in a, in a vehicle, that uh, standard becomes the universal standard within two year periods. 
and so that the others, the competitors, need to catch up. It provides an incentive for firms to get out in front to be the top runner. And so there are some possibilities for enlightened regulation that doesn't always pit environment against economy. Significantly, where states have not delivered on our environmental expectations, we've seen civil society and in particular non-governmental organizations uh, rise up. And remarkably, unelected groups, sometimes working out of basement churches, uh, sorry, church basements, uh, have come up with their own standards, which uh, also remarkably industry has signed on to. And the best examples here are the Forest Stewardship Council and the Marine Stewardship Council. So there are possibilities for non-state regulation. And, and in some sectors, this has been quite remarkable. Of course, we also have the rise of so-called corporate social responsibility, where firms voluntarily exceed the expectations of the state. And there's no better example, I think, today than, than Loblaw's embrace of sustainable seafood, an ambitious commitment that by the end of 2013, they will be selling exclusively sustainably sourced seafood through all their lines and uh, living up to the very highest standards, including MSC certification. So there are some who hope that in the absence of state regulation, industry will continue to move in this direction. And then we had British Petroleum, which for the past decade has worked harder than probably any firm to rebrand, happily being, uh, being understood as beyond petroleum instead of British Petroleum. And the event of last summer has been problematic <laughs> for so many reasons. Rather depressing event. First of all, with respect to corporate social responsibility, we have discovered that, that taking shortcuts with respect to safety, which might have saved them a few million dollars, uh, resulted in a, in a tragedy which has, of course, had environmental implications and financial ones for BP, potentially five, 15 billion worth. So the, one of the key incentives for corporate social responsibility, the so-called business case, that centers around risk management didn't seem to be enough. It's also problematic with respect to the rise of civil environmental regulation or the increasing role of civil society and NGOs because this is a sector that, unlike forestry and fisheries, doesn't seem to fit well with, with non-state regulatory systems. There is no great NGO campaign that is effectively regulating or at least guiding enlightened behavior within the oil and gas sector. So it could be that the NGOs or civil society in general can work effectively in some areas, but not all. And then finally, it's a damning example with respect to the role of the state. We know now, many of us, what the term agency capture is all about because we discovered that the regulator was not regulating the industry effectively. The metaphor that they were in bed with industry, in this case, had a literal meaning, I understand. I won't get into the gory details. Our president has already had enough fun with that metaphor. <laughs> so it's problematic with respect to some three key activities of environmental governance. And this could lead me to conclude that the next 10 years are not hopeful. Uh, but I won't conclude that way because the one thing that, that state response to the Great Depression showed us is that there can be times that are so trying that lead us to experiment in radical ways be it progressive income tax or the emergence of unemployment insurance or socialized medicine. And that if we uh, accept Thomas Friedman's argument, now is a similar time. And what the state can do here is not regulate behavior, but rather enable better behavior. And one of the greatest examples of this uh, would be the infrastructure which was paid in the equivalent of pub with public monies in ancient Rome, 600 years before Christ was born, when the greatest sewer, the Cloaca Maxima, was constructed to deal with what was then the key environmental health issue of the day, dealing with nightshades, the hygienic problems that all societies, all communities, cities have to deal with. So as early as 2,600 years ago, we made massive, or society made massive public investments to deal with a problem. And my suspicion is that the state can fulfill its obligations these, these secondary obligations toward environment through a massive infrastructure investment to enable us to switch to a green economy. And this is a more hopeful conclusion that I offer when we try to envision 2020. Thanks very much.